Hi guys, and welcome back. In today's video, we're gonna be talking about one of the most common correlated conditions and root causes for SIBO, and that is hyperglycemia, high blood sugar and diabetes. OMG, is this one common? And yes, this can be a root cause for your SIBO, and it can keep you stuck and prevent you from healing your SIBO if you do not address this. Stay tuned if you want to learn more. To start us off, I think it's worth pointing out that blood sugar is one of the single most foundational things that you need to maintain your health. If you had a blood sugar of zero, you would die very, very quickly. Similarly, if you had a blood sugar of say 800, you would become aware of that and it would cause dysfunction very quickly also. So there's a very narrow sweet spot where you want your blood sugar to be on a day-to-day -day basis and your body has built itself around that premise. Your body has built itself around the assumption that it will have a very specific amount of blood sugar 24 hours a day for your entire life. And this is where we start to see things go wonky when that becomes an untruth. So if your blood sugar is chronically elevated, like in the video we're gonna talk about today, or in another video down the road, we're gonna talk about hypoglycemia, low blood sugar, you see things go awry. So literally any cell in your entire body can get wonky, anything from the big toe of your right foot to your ability to have strong, healthy hair, to the health of your skin, the health of your gut, the health of your bones. Literally every cell in your entire body is going to be receptive to blood sugar fluctuations and hyper or hypoglycemia. So I wanna lay that foundation first, is that I'm gonna talk about some of the specific ways that hyperglycemia and SIBO are related and how it intertwines with the gut, but there's probably a million other small ways that dysglycemia is going to lead to dysfunction in the body or inflammation in the body. We are just touching the tip of the iceberg here today. All right, first and foremost, let's talk about how the liver and gallbladder are going to be involved in this high blood sugar gut health function web. So as you know, the liver is responsible for many different things, most famously detoxification. So if you take in something that is toxic or some sort of chemical burden, or if you have something toxic possibly coming up from your gut, like LPS, for example, endotoxin, bacterial toxins, it's your liver that has to deal with that. You have to either transform it and excrete it in bile or otherwise try to get rid of it or store it away. And your liver is your primary detoxification organ. So that's pretty relevant considering that we live in a very toxic world. But remember too, the liver is what's going to be making bile and then the bile is stored and concentrated in the gallbladder. So your ability to make bile, which is in and of itself a motility pr promoting agent and an antimicrobial, can be effective if your liver is affected and you are more likely to get gallbladder sludge or stones if you have hyperglycemia. So we start to get in this tangled web of perhaps the person has developed a little bit of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, their liver enzymes are creeping up, they have some liver inflammation and tissue damage, maybe they're not as, as skilled at making bile anymore, or the bile that they do make is turning into stones or turning into sludge, and then that can cause discomfort in and of itself. But also the, contract, the contractility of the gallbladder is going to affect motility directly, and that that can set the stage for SIBO. So not only are you not getting that homemade antimicrobial in the form of bile as effectively or as much as you should, but you might not be getting your motility running because of that deficit in bile. Now you might say, oh, maybe one solution is to just take a bile acid supplement. And yeah, that could help quite a lot. But remember, it's because the liver is inflamed or the liver is being affected, in this case, by the high blood sugar. So by all means, take bile enzymes, take you know, ox bile supplements, but also make sure that you're not flaming out your liver because of hyperglycemia and watch your sugar intake, watch your processed carbohydrate intake, and make sure that you're doing right by your liver and your blood sugar regulation. The next one that I wanted to share is the nervous system. Now this could be the topic of an entire video probably unto itself, but one thing to know about the nervous system is that it, it's kind of persnickety and kind of particular in certain ways. It's also very flexible and it's going to adapt to whatever you throw at it, but your brain and all of your neurons need some stimulation. You know the, the phrase, use it or lose it. 
that happens very much so with the nervous system. If you're not using a particular pathway or a particular memory or a particular skill, it starts to wane and those synapses start to not fire as well. So you need stimulation, blood sugar, and, or fuel just in general, we could say, and you need oxygen exchange. So states of anemia or iron deficiency can really play a role in neurogenic inflammation as well. But I wanna hyper-focus on the blood sugar thing. Neurons like a very stable amount of blood sugar. And yes, even if you're doing keto or carnivore or some other low carbohydrate diet, you are always going to have blood sugar. There is no such thing as human physiology that supports a zero blood sugar. That is not a thing. If your body needs to, it's gonna start pulling protein or carbs or possibly even fat from the rest of your body and you're going to make sugar to keep your blood sugar stable, albeit a little bit lower than normal. But nonetheless, hyperglycemia can lead to all sorts of squirreliness with the nervous system. In particular, diabetes is now being called, or rather Alzheimer's disease is now being called type three diabetes because it is so well associated with Alzheimer's disease and also Parkinson's. So not only do your neurons become unhealthy and start to degenerate and lose their function over time, and that affects your cognitive ability and your ability to rationalize and think and use your, your higher brain centers, but also you start affecting things like the brain stem and the cerebellum and you guessed it, the vagus nerve. There is some wild, wild research and it doesn't get talked enough in this about, it doesn't get talked about enough in this space, that was a tongue twister, that the vagus nerve or vagal nerve neuropathy is very, very common in diabetics, both type one and type two. And the diameter of the vagus nerve is literally smaller in people with diabetes compared to healthy controls. So of all the nerves in your body, every single one of them dislikes high blood sugar and diabetes, but out of all the nerves that a person with SIBO should care about the most, the vagus nerve is specifically compromised when you are in a high blood sugar state. So that it's no surprise that people with diabetes very frequently have poor motility or slow gastric emptying or SIBO. There's a very high incidence of SIBO in people who have type two diabetes and type one diabetes. And it's not surprising knowing what that does to the vagus nerve. Not only that, but hyperglycemia is also gonna muck up your hormones. Just ask any woman who's hypothyroid or has PCOS and they'll quickly tell you that. So in the example of thyroid hormone or estrogen, and I would argue also testosterone, all of those hormones are needed and necessary for running motility, interacting with your immune system, local in the gut, and healing the gut lining. So if you have any sort of leaky gut, and you also have wonky tonky hormones, yes, that's the technical term for it. If your hormones are out of balance, then you're gonna have a really hard time healing the leaky gut and repairing that gut barrier or running your motility in the absence of adequate hormone levels, or if you have too many. So don't, don't neglect the hyperglycemia piece of how it affects your hormones. And I, the way to think about this, if nothing else, is that remember that blood sugar is largely regulated by insulin and glucagon. Those are hormones and hormones all talk to each other. So estrogen and progesterone chit chat with each other. Estrogen and testosterone chit chat with each other and interact with each other. Estrogen and thyroid hormone, the two of them interact with each other and chit chat. And sure as heck, things like leptin, insulin and glucagon talk to the other hormones. They interact with the other hormones and their transcription will affect the other hormones. So. Just having hyperglycemia means that you probably also have high insulin levels, and then those high insulin levels will mess with the other hormones. In men, in that case, then usually it results in converting more of your testosterone into estrogen. So it's like you're losing your testosterone down the chute, down to estrogen. So you get a combination of estrogen dominant symptoms and testosterone deficiency symptoms in men. In women, the same thing can happen, or you can manifest it more as like a polycystic ovarian type syndrome. It can play out a couple of different ways in women, but just know that hyperglycemia is going to mess with all of your hormones, not just insulin, but across the entire body and probably things like progesterone and other hormones as well. So like cortisol as an example, all of them are going to be disrupted by blood sugar imbalance. And then last but not least, I want to pay extra special attention to the immune system and inflammation. And 
I've mentioned this in videos before, but I'm going to mention it again. Saying that you have inflammation is useful, but only to a certain degree. Saying that you have inflammation is kind of the equivalent of saying, I have soup. It paints a picture and it's better than no information, but it also doesn't get as specific as you really need. If you ask somebody, hey, I have the soup, do you want it? They're not going to know because maybe that person loves chicken noodle soup, but they hate tomato soup. Or maybe they love tomato soup, but they hate clam chowder. So we can get more granular, we can get more detailed when we explain inflammation. So acknowledging that, it's kind of an umbrella term, but nonetheless, most sources of what we call inflammation have some roots with the immune system. Immune system dysfunction or imbalance. You know, I know we've talked about this a little bit in my histamine and mast cell activation videos, for example, but the balance or lack thereof in the immune system will tend to skew the signaling molecules that the immune system is churning out. And then those signaling molecules will create the environment, the soup that we call inflammation. And then inflammation, well, gosh, I mean, inflammation can affect the liver. And then you get some of that NAFLD or inflammatory process in the liver going on, maybe some gallbladder sludge. Inflammation sure as heck impacts the hormones and it may or may not result in overt autoimmunity, which is a whole nother topic for another day. It can result in inflammation that affects the nervous system. Anybody who's ever had brain fog or fatigue knows this very well, that inflammation out in the body can go back up and affect the brain and the nervous system. And you guessed it, the vagus nerve. And of course, inflammation can stay local in the gut and this can do things like induce leaky gut syndrome, impair motility, or interact with the microbiome itself. Because these immune cells are directly interacting with your microbiome, they are learning from the microbiome, and they're, they're teaching each other how to deal with each other. So if your immune system is chronically PO'd, there is some likelihood that it's going to communicate with the microbiome in a way that is not super favorable for your health and happiness. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. So these are the big four ways that I see blood sugar directly impacting the gut. The immune system slash inflammation, hormone imbalance, nervous system and vagus nerve impairment, and liver and gallbladder impairment. But here's where things get especially squirrely because it's not just a one-way street. It's not just that high blood sugar affects these things and then affects the gut and that's the end of the story. Because if that was the case, then anybody who has hyperglycemia or diabetes would treat their diabetes, treat their high blood sugar, and then poof, the SIBO would go away and nobody would be watching this YouTube channel right now. There is another direction to it. So remember, and you'll, you'll wanna refer back primarily to my endotoxemia videos, uh, as well as the SIBO and weight gain video, if you're interested in fleshing this out more. But remember that the other side of the coin is that gut dysfunction, gut dysbiosis, so an imbalance between the good and the bad bacteria, or good and the bad yeast, because yes, there are good yeast, or if you have leaky gut, that will tend to allow more bacterial toxins and more metabolites from the microbiome to go out into systemic circulation. So you get some leaky gut, you get a little bit of that endotoxemia thing happening, so you have more of those endotoxins crossing the gut barrier pissing off the immune system for one, and then going out into circulation and flaming out the liver and inducing insulin resistance. There is more and more research now that leaky gut and endotoxemia and deficiency in certain good microbes such as acromantia can possibly lead to diabetes or hyperglycemia. Now that doesn't give you a free reign to just take an acromantia probiotic and then eat a donut, but it does paint a picture that this is a two-way street and we can't ignore one side over the other. So by all means, still address the microbiome dysbiosis, do antimicrobials if you need to for the sake of clearing the SIBO, things like prokinetics, work on the gut in whatever way you need to, and know that you are going to be doing things to heal the body. But this is where you know, the root cause thing gets so complicated because we tend to think of root causes as one direction like X caused Y, and if I just treat X, if I just get rid of X, then Y will clear up. But what is more true of human physiology typically is that X leads to Y, and then Y encourages more X, and you get this catch-22. You get this, this feeling stuck in a rut kind of situation 
And where we need to come in oftentimes is we need to put a monkey wrench here or here and try to treat this holistically so that we break that vicious cycle. So in the case of SIBO and diabetes or hyperglycemia, yes, you need to be mindful of your blood sugar and you need to eat in a way that is favorable for lowering your blood sugar, but you still need to heal the gut and you need to work on that in whatever way is appropriate for you because having dysbiosis or having SIBO is gonna make you more likely to be stuck in that hyperglycemic or diabetic state. So do make sure that you're addressing both ends of this continuum and not getting stuck in this sort of framework. You really wanna think of more of this as a loop and you getting stuck in that loop and you need to throw a monkey wrench in there to kind of break it up and let your body snap out of it. As always, I really hope that this video was helpful. I hope that you learned something about blood sugar regulation and your gut or had some aha moments that would lead to further success or progress in your healing journey. If you had any big aha moments, I would love to hear them in the doobly-doo down below. And as always, if you have any ideas for topics for me to cover, I would love to hear that. I did a post recently about that and you could take a survey or you could just comment down below. I would love to hear your ideas. And as always, I will see you next week here for more videos about gut health. Hey guys, if you like this video, be sure to subscribe, ring the bell, click the like button, and leave a comment down below with the videos that you would like to see me do next. Doing all of those really helps support the channel and support my efforts in making as many videos as possible for you guys. Thanks so much, and I'll see you in the next video.